Hey there, I'm Glenn Weldon, and this is NPR's Book of the Day. A poem can be thought of as an act of self-interrogation. After all, writing it is a process of isolation and distillation and concentration. It can become a kind of emotional surgery that slices away the comforting lies we tell ourselves, the facades we hide behind. What's left is what's essential. That's the whole point. We're going to hear from a couple of poets today. Both of them have written memoirs that give a bit more room to the kind of ruthless introspection that their poetry is known for. The results are just as truthful and funny and painful, but they're surrounded by narratives that add a very human nuance and context. In a minute, poet and author Kwame Alexander will talk about his latest, a book that transformed itself in form and in intent during the writing process. But first up, we'll hear from the poet Maggie Smith, who had one of her poems become an internet sensation a few years back. Well, it's, that's not supposed to happen. Memes go viral, but free verse... It changed her career and her life. She walks us through all of that in her memoir, You Could Make This Place Beautiful. Here she is with NPR's Miles Parks. In 2016, a poem titled Good Bones went viral. You might remember it. Life is short, though I keep this from my children. Life is short, and I've shortened mine in a thousand delicious, ill-advised ways. A thousand deliciously ill-advised ways I'll keep from my children. The world is at least 50% terrible, and that's a conservative estimate, though I keep this from my children. That's Maggie Smith reading the first lines of her poem. It electrified her writing career, and it changed her life in a multitude of other ways as well. She writes all about that, what happened before and after, in her new memoir, You Could Make This Place Beautiful. And she joins us now. Hi, Maggie. Hi. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm wondering if we can start there. Talk me through what it was like when Good Bones went viral. As a, you know, middle-aged mom of two young kids in central Ohio, <laughs> it's hard to overstate how completely bewildering and wonderful and confusing and strange and thrilling that was. Um, I'd been writing for years and years and had published a couple of books at that point But the poetry readership is generally sort of small and discerning. And so that poem widened my readership in a way I just, I couldn't have anticipated. The memoir touches a lot on your work, but it really focuses on the end of your marriage. Tell us a little bit about your husband and then what happened to your marriage after this poem went viral. Well, I mean, we are a couple with two kids and we both worked, although he worked out of the house and I worked inside the house and was the primary caregiver. And that is probably where the issue sort of stems from. I think many of us have had changes in our marriage that require some sort of recalibration. And in most cases, we're able to plan for them. But a poem going viral isn't something that you can plan for. And it's not something that you can sit down with your spouse and say, I'm about to get a ton of requests to travel. And as the primary caregiver, I'm going to need to hand things off to you in order to do this because this has been my dream my whole life. Maybe with some planning, it could have been (laughs) different, but it caused a lot of tension. One of the striking moments in the book for me was that moment where I believe it was your husband's attorney used air quotes around the phrase, your work. Can you talk about that moment and just kind of this idea of your work being considered legitimate? Yeah. I mean, uh, some of it, honestly, is when you're in the arts, your work doesn't look necessarily like other people's jobs. My work might look like going to a city and giving a reading at a bookstore. It might look like teaching a class in another city for a week or going to a literary festival. And it might look more fun than work should look. But yes, yeah, so I think in part, there is a sort of diminishment of working in, in a creative field. I think in part, if you're not the primary earner, you know, there may have been some resentment about the time that it took up not being, quote, worth it. It's hard to know. I also want to talk about the format of this book. It reads almost like a diary. You know, it, it moves. You kind of revisit ideas that were a few pages back and you say, actually, Here's how I think about it now, or my my view on this is kind of changing. How did you come to format it this way or write it this way? Well, I knew early on it would be vignettes because I'm a poet. And compression, concision, lyricism, 
a focus on metaphor, a focus on image. These are all things that I'm, you know, dragging from my poetry toolkit into my prose. And I wanted to not only tell the story, but to help the reader feel the experience. And I figured if I'm going to be this vulnerable in the telling, I want to be able to show up and really talk person to person. Like my kids' math homework, the teacher says, don't just give me the answer, show your thinking. So I wanted to be able to show my thinking in this book. The fundamental issues in your and your ex-husband's relationship, how much of them were unique to you, your and his kind of dynamic and personalities versus how much of this is systemic, like just from the fact that we live in a patriarchal society. Were you able to parse between those two things at all? I think the patriarchal foundation of it is huge. I don't know exactly how much of the pie chart, if I had to color it in, is that, you know, what the sort of invisible labor, the power dynamics in a marriage, the balancing of work and motherhood, um, the considering the worth and value of your time, even if you're not making most of the actual money. All of these things are huge. And then you add something really particular, like a viral poem, into the mix. And in some ways, now looking at it, I'm like, well, that's, I think, what we call a perfect storm. I have to ask, too, I am a child of divorced parents. And Honestly, your ex-husband does not come across looking great after reading this book. And I was thinking about how much you thought about what you wanted to share, considering your two children are probably going to read this book or may have already read some of it at this point. My parents have grappled for a long time, even now that I'm an adult, with how much of their personal relationship to share with me and my brothers. How much did you grapple with that? Oh, a ton. I mean, my kids are sort of always my first consideration about how I talk about myself. And that's that's really why I say I can only speak for myself. And I'll also say really not much of this book will be a surprise or is a secret. And I don't I don't believe in family secrets. I think family secrets are poison. I think kids usually know more than we're telling them. If and when they choose to read this book, probably what we'll do is sit down and have a conversation beforehand so that we can talk our way through it. Have you heard from your ex-husband about the book or did you talk to him before it published? No. And you haven't heard since? No. Do you? Does it matter, I guess, how he feels about any of this? I'm asking genuinely. I don't know the answer. I don't know that there is an answer. I think I just got to a point in my life where I decided not to make decisions for myself based on anxiety and fear. And all I can do is sort of approach the project with honesty and integrity and and do my best to keep to keep it centered on my own experience. And and I've done my best at that. There is so much grief and pain in this book and throughout this time that you write about. How are you doing now, now that the book is done? I mean, has it helped you find any of the peace that it seems like you were looking for? Well, thank you for asking. <laughs> you know, I am I am doing really well. I mean, it, it was a really emotional writing experience, as I'm sure you can imagine having read it. But I did come out the other side of it, I think, with a new sense of sort of fortitude about who I am as a person and the kind of work I want to be doing in the world and and not allowing myself to be scared or small or to sort of snip off pieces of myself and and bargain them away over time which I think some of us can can find that we've done in the middle of our lives and so so no it's it's been a, not an uncomplicated journey and it's not an uncomplicated time right now but i'm happy that's author maggie smith her new memoir is you could make this place beautiful thank you so much for talking us through this maggie thank you poet kwame alexander just wanted to write some love poems but life got in the way the loss of a parent the end of a marriage estrangement from a child As he was writing, the pain he was feeling and the dark humor that helped him deal with it expanded beyond the edges of the poems, and suddenly he was writing a memoir. 
one that directly engaged with everything that was going on in his life and did so with a kind of blistering honesty, the kind of blistering honesty that would lead him to give the book the haunting title, Why Fathers Cry at Night. Here he is with Michelle Martin on NPR's Morning Edition. Kwame Alexander is a familiar name here on Morning Edition. He's had many wonderful visits with our friend Rachel Martin, creating and sharing community crowdsourced poems, talking about his poetry and award-winning young adult novels. But now he's got something new for us. It's a memoir of sorts. We'll ask him to explain why I said that. It's called Why Fathers Cry at Night, and he is with us now to tell us more about it. Welcome back. Hey, it's good to be here, Michelle. So why the memoir now? I mean, you could argue that a lot of poetry, especially your very personal work, uh, is in some ways memoir. But this more directly describes your life story. But what made you want to? It started off as a book of love poems that I wanted to write that would hopefully have some impact on readers, make them feel good, make them think about their love lives. And as I wrote it, I realized that I was telling a story. The, the poems were cr- chronological. And then I began to write prose pieces to support the poetry pieces. And then I began to think about the recipes that my mother and my grandmother used in their kitchens that were, you know, um, that, that were fueling some of these prose pieces. And so I began to in- include recipes. And before I knew it, it was this, this book became sort of a mirror of what parenting is. And, um, you know, from a philosophical or just from a really intimate personal perspective, I realized that I was in sort of a crisis, and this was around 2017. My mother had passed. My marriage was falling apart. My oldest daughter, I have two kids, my oldest daughter had stopped speaking with us. And at the same time, Michelle, I'm winning all these awards for Mm -hmm. my books. But I wasn't happy, Hmm. and I didn't know what to do about it. And so that's where the writing started. So this is where we get to the pain parts. There are some hilarious parts in this book, but there are the pain parts, and the pain parts are ones that I think will be familiar to anybody who has relationships with anyone. And this is where I'm going to ask you to read, if you read one of the poems, it's Without You. Without you, I am lost, as in isolated, unfinished, broken off, shipwrecked on the shore of solitude, ankle deep in possibility. I have read the dictionary twice and still there are no words to fill my blank spaces, to punctuate the way I feel when your smile dances across the stucco walls of my memory. Perhaps I will open a thesaurus now and find a little piece of hope or something similar. Tell me about it. I think this is one of those experiences that could apply to so many relationships that get ruptured. Could be a love, could be a friend. Yeah, I think it's all of the above. You've been married for 23 years, and now your marriage is over. You don't stop thinking about the person. Your daughter, your firstborn child, you all have an argument, and it explodes into something you could never have imagined a not speaking with each other for years. Like, how does that happen? Those crises, there's a longing, there's a missing, and not to even mention you know, your mother passing away. I'm dealing with all this stuff at the same time, and I don't know how to handle it. I'm unprepared for that kind of loss. You know, this is something the therapist will tell you to do. You know, journal, write it down, put it in a drawer someplace until you're ready to deal with those big feelings. A couple questions occur to me. This is other people's stories, too, but you're the one who gets to tell it. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's fair? My father called me after he read the book, Michelle, and he said, tell your publisher I read your little memoir, and I will be suing you for slander. Oh, boy. Ouch. (laughs) And then in the next moment, he's like, so how you been? (laughs) I think it's fair for me to share what I have been going through mm-hmm. and on this canvas of, of life that, is, that has been full of woe and wonder and, and tragedy and triumph. This is me painting my picture. I think, that's, I think that's very fair. Now that you have 
you know, laid your soul bare in this way. I, I would, I could argue. I said, uh, having read your earlier works, especially your poetry, that that you have done so for for some time. You've been very vulnerable and opened your heart up. But this is different in the sense that there's no there's no hiding behind the metaphors. <laughs> You know, right. so how does that feel now that you've done so? Would, Especially, can I may I say, as yeah. an African American man, yeah. for whom that kind of vulnerability is not always welcome or safe. Oh, yeah, it's it's we're not taught that. You know, I have two really good friends, Marshall and Mike, who I've known for for thirty years, and I've been really busy with my career. You know, that's been my excuse why I haven't been able to hang and, and spend time and do the things that the fellas do. So I planned a trip, just the three of us, and it was wonderful. And we're sitting at dinner, and I'm like, fellas, have I had a wall up emotionally during our friendship? Have I been, have I been vulnerable? Have I shared with y'all? Like, I'm just in the moment, right? Because I'm, fe- I'm trying to learn and, and do the work that I write about in this book. And... And they both look at me and laugh at the same time. And they say, dude, you've always been surface. (laughs) And I'm like, what? (laughs) And so I think you're right that I've hidden behind the metaphor. I've I've avoided being able to really be as forthcoming and honest and authentic with who I am as a man, as a black man. And how do I feel now? Mm -hmm. I feel like this book has forced me to do that. And that's hard. And yeah, I've woken up with panic attacks and called my editor and said, pull the book. But ultimately, I feel like it was necessary and I'm going to be better. Kwame Alexander is the number one New York Times bestselling author of 38 books. He is the showrunner and executive producer of the TV series based on his award-winning novel, The Crossover. And his latest book that we've been talking about is Why Fathers Cry at Night. Kwame Alexander, thank you so much for talking with us about this very precious work. Thank you for listening and letting me talk about it. That's it for this week on NPR's Book of the Day. Let us know what you think. You can write to us at bookofthedaya at npr.org. I'm Glenn Weldon. The podcast is produced by Isabella Gomez Sarmiento and edited by Megan Sullivan. Our founding editor is Petra Mayer. The show elements for this week were produced and edited by Ziad Butch, Jan Johnson, Elena Burnett, Courtney Dorning, Samantha Balaban, Ed McNulty, Gabriel Donatov, Melissa Gray, Nina Kravinsky, and Rita Advani. Beth Donovan is our managing editor. Thanks for listening. Thank you.